Good morning, church. How about that happy music? Are you ready? Does that, does that fire you up? Are you ready to get into the Word of God now? Well, what was wrong with you before? Why did you need music to get ready for that? That's what I want to know. Starting a new chapter today. Starting a new book today. Starting a new season for us today. First, second, and third, John. On page 1072, if you have the right Bible. If not, I can't help you. Suffer. The Apostle John, an interesting guy, he had this brother. They were called the Sons of Thunder. There was a time in Scripture where they wanted to call down fire from heaven against these guys. Jesus, you want us to call down fire from heaven and wipe those guys? He's like, no, 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 no. Calm down. Settle down. There was another time there were some guys ministering to some people. They said, Jesus, we told them to stop because they weren't with us. Jesus was like, no, no, no. Calm down. It's okay. There was another time when, and we don't know if they asked their mom to do this or not, or if she just took it on herself. I know you moms. I know how you work sometimes. But there's a point where the sons of thunder's mom goes to Jesus, a little sidebar, like, hey, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, like when this is the real deal, why don't you have one of my boys sit on your left and one sit on the right? You know, it's like she's talking up her boys. After the transformation, though. We talk about the transformation in Peter. When the Holy Spirit came upon him, now he can preach with power and authority and wisdom and everything he says makes sense for the first time in his life. We look at the, the Saul to Paul conversion. We, we, we see the amazing transformation. This thing with, with John is no less amazing. It goes from having his mom ask for a special seat for him next to Jesus to he's now so humble as a servant of God, that he doesn't even refer to himself by name in his gospel. He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. He had a whole new context for his life at that point. In his gospel, it's just the sweetest, the most personal, the most intimate account of Jesus who he is and what he's like. Anytime I'm encouraging somebody to learn more about Jesus, I send them to the Gospel of John. Now we have these letters. First, second, and third John. They don't identify the writer either. It doesn't refer to any title or name or anything in in the first book. The second and third, it starts just with the elder. And then he starts talking. He's pushed himself to the background. He, he's taken on that, that John the Baptist attitude of I must decrease. He must increase. How do we know that it's John then? You spend enough time in his writings, you will see his personality come through in the message and the wording, the delivery of these letters. And it's believed that the timing of the writing was somewhere in the A.D. 85 to 95 range. Most people actually say 90 to 95. A few outliers say 65. That doesn't seem very plausible. By this time, he's the only one of the original apostles left. So you read a a letter in A.D. 90 or A.D. 95 that was written by somebody just known as the elder. You're like, well, it must be John. He's the only guy left. For all of Paul's teaching concerning the danger of mixing the law in with the new covenant. He talked about that a lot when we went through Romans. John will be focusing a little differently. He'll be looking mostly at at warnings not to allow the new covenant itself to be twisted. Obviously, false prophets and teachers were warned about by Paul, by Peter. Uh, Peter talks about that quite a bit. That was happening as, as early as as the the 50s and the 60s, like not long after Jesus, there were really seriously uh, prevalent false teachers and prophets out there. And those guys were writing about that. And now some of this stuff has really gained traction. It's really become embedded in, in some of the churches, mostly Gnosticism, but some other things as well. Seems like when he gives warnings here in this book, he's talking about Gnosticism for the most part is, and it's John's 
will for the people to return to the foundational truths that are being trampled by such heresies or to keep from falling into them in the first place. With the heart of a pastor, he will encourage believers to trust in and be joyful about the certainty of the essential principles that he and the other apostles had been teaching for six decades now, which is why I'm calling this series Abide. He will talk about abiding in Christ. Jesus talks about abiding in Christ. In the Greek, that word means stay, continue, dwell, endure. My wording, make yourself at home in. Rest in the truth of the gospel. Rest in Jesus. May we always take John's advice and abide in the gospel, trusting that Jesus is who he says he is, that he can do what he says he can do. Lord, we come before you this morning asking that you speak to us from your word today. We open a fresh book. May we have fresh ears on today to hear what it is that you have to say. There's not a one of us who knows everything that you intend for us to know from 1 John chapter 1. So help us to focus on you right now, to push everything else to the side and to just listen. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take control of this message. If there's anything of me in it, let it be pushed to the side. Let me decrease that Jesus would increase. May you be glorified. It's in Jesus' name. God's people said, 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. The letter begins with that which was from the beginning, tying Jesus to the starting point of our reality. This month's memory verse is Genesis 1.1. Say it with me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John says, and from the beginning was Jesus. And the truth, when he begins his gospel in the same way, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. John always stresses the connection between the beginning of creation and the beginnings of our knowledge of Jesus. An important point of reference for the context of who Jesus is. He is a prophet and a teacher and a shepherd and uh, all of those things. But he is the eternal God. He is one with the Father and the Spirit, not a created being, not one who attained accolade and authority, but rather he is preexistent. In the beginning, he was already there. He is the preeminent one. Don't miss the point here Two, the fact that that which was from the beginning turns out to be the very same thing as the what we saw that John wants to tell us about. God, his nature, his love, his grace, his desire to seek and save that which is lost, none of those things have changed a bit over the thousands of years since in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The message of the gospel is stable, eternally stable. No matter what worldly fads or ideas come and go, salvation is based on that which was from the beginning and can still be seen and heard and touched. It's just as important as the understanding of the preeminence of Jesus is the understanding that he became an actual member of humanity as well, fully God, fully man. The fact that he points that out, that's a clue that Gnosticism is at least one of the heretical movements that John is warning against because it taught that Jesus was never literally here. 
It thought that all physical matter was evil. And so Jesus couldn't have literally put on human flesh. That would have made him evil. They taught that he was only a visible spirit or, or something akin to a hologram. John wants to emphasize that Jesus was heard and seen and touched. Both before and after his death, burial, and resurrection. In the same way that every other person ever born into the world has been heard and seen and touched, so was Jesus. To believe or teach otherwise is to negate the power of the gospel. It messes with the message. The gospel proclaims that Jesus led a sinless human life. That's what made him worthy of being the sacrifice offered up for the penalty for our sin. That's why he's the spotless lamb. To believe or teach otherwise is to attack the gospel itself, which puts the very idea of salvation in question. It's the same old trick from the enemy. Is that really what happened? Did he really say that? Ah, come on, think about it. No, don't think about it. Believe it. Listen to the eyewitness testimony of the guys who were there. Nobody doubts the validity of Aristotle or any of the other writers that, that people study these days. Socrates, yep, he was real. And we believe he said everything is in those books. But bring up Jesus, oh, no, man, man made that. No. Believe the eyewitnesses who were there. John wants to debunk any philosophical ideas from scholars who, manipulated by the enemy, believe something other than what he and the other apostles quite literally experienced in their time walking with Jesus. He wants us to know that this is eyewitness testimony, not some academically based thought study, not something they cooked up in their heads, not something they heard about from somebody else. No, the disciples heard and saw and touched Jesus. They were in a position to honestly bear witness and declare the truth about him. But guess what? We're in the same boat. How real is Jesus to you? Have you experienced personally his literal presence in your life in some way? Oh, if so, then tell people about it. And shout it from the rooftops. Bear witness and declare the truth. I do this all the time when talking to people who are skeptical about Jesus or the church. Because of my personal experiences, I'm able to say in all honesty, you think this about God, that he is harsh and cold and unwilling to help. But here's what I have heard and seen and touched. You haven't felt the presence of Jesus or the Holy Spirit in your life yet, so you can't imagine that what the Bible says is true. But here's what I have heard and seen and touched. You got hurt by the church. Guess what? Me too. But let me tell you about the one I'm at now. Nobody with an argument ever has an advantage over somebody with a real testimony. To people who don't believe because they haven't yet received the blessings I'm telling them are available, there's some different illustrations you can use for that. Here's one. Hey, I'm not receiving all the perks that come from being a member of the Titans. The salary, the attention, none of that stuff. That doesn't mean that the Titans don't exist. It means I'm not on the Titans roster. <laughs> That's all it means. Or... If my hair is long and grungy and unhealthy, just flat out ugly, does that mean that barbers and stylists don't exist? <laughs> or does the fact that some of you have beautiful hair prove that they do exist and that I just haven't taken the initiative to go where they are and do what is necessary to receive the services they offer? That's what's going on in the lives of the lost. This is why they haven't experienced God. It's not because he isn't there. And our testimony should be heard so that they can know that. 
They, they shouldn't be able to avoid that. Once Jesus is real to you, you will have a story about his impact on your life. And like John, you will then be in a position to bear witness and declare the truth concerning him to others. Verse 3 needs to be in effect continually in your life if you belong to Jesus. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. That you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. When I'm trying to witness to skeptics, I'm able to say, don't give me any of that God, any of that God isn't real stuff. Because I know He was there and spoke truth into my life when I was on the brink of killing myself. I know what he said to me when, when one of my daughters was caught up in some things and I couldn't figure out what it was. I know I was sitting in this room on the back row uh, of the church listening to Pastor Philip preach when God said to me, go look at her phone in the car. And that told me everything that I needed to know. I know that it's been him that gave me wisdom and peace and strength beyond my own to be able to handle the storms in my life, things I would not have been able to handle before he came into my life and changed me into something new. Try to convince me God doesn't exist. You would do just as well to try and convince me that my wife of 34 years is a figment of my imagination. He is just as real to me as she is and as you are. Just because you haven't met him yet does not mean that he does not exist. John says, Jesus was manifested to us. He became a reality in my life so that you could have fellowship with me as I fellowship with him. So that you can have access to the same blessings I do. A real, personal, tangible relationship with the Lord of all creation. That is our purpose for still being here. This fellowship that he's talking about, koinonia in the Greek, association with, participation with, communion with. It's a term referring to an intimate connection with somebody else. It's intended uh, reality is, is not only for our connection to be like that with other people, but with Jesus. This is what it's hard for even people who believe in spiritual things to grapple with. They, they can't take that in. They're, they have a mindset of, no, if there's a God, he's so far above us. He, he would never like besmirch himself by, by hanging out with us. That's the difference between us and all the other God systems that people teach. Our God loves us. He didn't just make us and set things in motion to step back and watch. No, he wants to be a part of your life. He wants koinonia with you. He wants communion with you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants you to enjoy one another's company. It's astounding. And John says, listen, if, you, if you're not part of the team yet, if you're not on the roster yet, at least hang out with me because I'm hanging out with Jesus so I can help show you what it's like and can help show you what the experience is and why it has made such an impact on my life. I can bear witness and declare. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the vertical relationship, the koinonia we're supposed to have. Acts 2, 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. That's the horizontal koinonia that we're supposed to have. What does this, this look like in our horizontal relationship? We spend time together. We break bread together, we pray together, we talk to one another, we get to know each other. We, like Paul said, we greet one another warmly when we see each other. We know what's going on in each other's lives. The small groups that we have, they're called life-on-life -life groups. 
We should be intertwined to some degree with other believers. Close, like family is supposed to be. What does it look like on the vertical? The account of two disciples on the road to Emmaus after Jesus' burial gives us a glimpse of that. These two guys are walking along the way. They're, they're going back home. Okay, Jesus has died. He's been buried. And he's risen again. They just don't know it yet. They haven't gotten the news. So they're walking along, and they're sad. And all of a sudden, this stranger is walking with them, kind of appears out of nowhere. And he says, why are you so sad? And they said, where have you been? Don't you know what has happened? They didn't realize it was Jesus. And they went on to tell him the story of how Jesus had died on the cross and had been buried. Their Lord had died. And so he just keeps walking with them and he starts explaining Scripture to them. He starts with Moses. He works his way all, up, all the way through the Old Testament. He opens the Word to them. He explains how it all pointed to him. And they get to the place that they're going to stop for the night. And he acts like he's going to go on, but they don't want him to leave. They, they're, they've been fellowshipping with this stranger. And they like having him there. They like listening to him uh, explain and teach the word. So they beg him to stay, and he stays. And they're sitting there eating. And, and the story ends, Luke 24, starting in verse 30. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us, that's what fellowship with Jesus sounds, looks, and feels like. You can't mistake it. When you are in the presence of God, you know it. When we have the afterglows here, And we cry out to the Spirit of God, do you have anything you want to say to us as a group or any individuals here? We have a, a time of prayer where we'd ask the Spirit of God to heal people or give wisdom or grant blessings. We have a, a time of, of really kind of intense personal but corporate worship. It's just a, I can't, you got to come. I can't really describe it, but I'll, t I'll tell you this. People say, when's it over? And I say, when the room cools down. Because when we invite the Spirit to meet us there and speak and bless us, I'm not kidding you, the temperature of the room rises. And I don't care when everybody else has to go home, you can leave whenever you want. But I don't leave this room until it's cold. I love it. That's what fellowship with God sounds, looks, and feels like. Verse 4. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Full. In the Greek, it means crammed with. Literally, that's what the definition says. Crammed with. It's like Peter's fishing nets filled so full by a miracle of Jesus that they were busting at the seams when they tried to lift them out of the water. John says that's the reason for the writing of this letter, so that joy would be crammed into you until you're so full of it that you might burst. I hope that's what you mean when you tell other people that your pastor is full of it. <laughs> I think that's what the road to Emmaus guys meant. When they said, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road? I think they felt like they were going to burst because of the presence of God. I don't know how much more full and joyful a life can be than when a person is in fellowship with the living God. And that's been part of the plan all along. In John's gospel, chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. 
And another translation says that they may have it to the full. After today, I would say, my version would say, and they would have it until they're just crammed full of it. The peace that passes understanding, the joy in the midst of the storm that others see in believers is described this way by, by an old preacher. His name is Elton Trueblood. I feel like I need to do this when I say his name. Elton Trueblood. He said, the Christian is joyful not because he is blind to injustice and suffering, but because he is convinced that these, in the light of divine sovereignty, are never ultimate. The humor of the Christian is not a way of denying the tears, but rather a way of affirming something that is deeper than the tears. And that's it exactly. Verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. John says, listen. We didn't get this from some book. It wasn't the indoctrination of our families that we grew up in. It wasn't pressure from the culture to believe something popular. No, we received this message from Jesus himself, and now we're passing it along to you. Paul says it like this in Galatians 1, verse 12, For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's interesting for Paul to say that because he was a learned man. He spent a lot of time studying Scripture and teaching Scripture. The rabbi that trained him up said the only problem he ever had with Paul was he couldn't find enough books for him to read. He was as educated as it gets. But the gospel, he says, I wasn't taught that. That had to be revealed to me by Jesus. Just so you know, so that you can be more confident in your own understanding of the gospel and your faith in it, and so that you can pass it on more fervently, the exact same thing is true of you as well. If you are a follower of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 14 speaks of you. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. If you've got it, if you have heard, understood, and been able to submit to the gospel, it is because God gave it to you. Talk about the gift that keeps giving. He says, God is light, and in him is no darkness. What a great illustration, light and dark. Everybody understands that. Metaphorically, in the Greek, light means of truth and its knowledge, to, together with the spiritual purity that's associated with it. Darkness, metaphorically, ignorance of divine things the wickedness associated with that ignorance, or the rejection of divine truth. It's important to settle this in your heart, that there is absolutely no impurity or wrongness in God. Because your flesh and the enemy and the culture around you will go to great lengths to try and convince you that there is. It's been the attack from the beginning. God didn't want you to have that fruit because it would be a blessing to you. And he doesn't want you to have that blessing. You'll be like him if you eat that fruit. He's withholding that from you. The same argument applies today when anybody is tempted to believe something negative about God. The enemy is whispering in their ear. The flesh wants to hear that message. And the culture is right there to support it. 100%. 
the only thing that can confound that, can get over on that, can overwhelm that is the power of the Holy Spirit around you revealing truth before you're saved, in you revealing truth once you are saved. It's what is necessary and it's what has been provided. If you have it, it's because He gave it to you. He gave it to you because He is light. And in Him there is no darkness. So when you doubt that, even for an instant, take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ and choose to doubt your doubts instead. You get to decide. You have to decide. It's not just that God has light. It says He is light. He defines light, purity, truth. This light is is prevalent in our understanding of who Jesus is too. This all-encompassing truth that will never change. John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 12, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who believes me, he who follows me, shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Back in chapter 3 of his gospel, verse 19, and this is the condemnation. This is Jesus. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Why is it so important to get this concept of God's reality? Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We can't have fellowship. This is the same word from earlier, koinonia. We can't have joint participation and communion, this intimate relationship with God, If we walk in darkness. The word walk, it's it's an encompassing word. It means tread all around, be occupied with, head in the direction of. In Amos chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Can two walk together unless they are agreed? It makes sense. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship, what koinonia, what joint participation has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Be yoked to Jesus instead. That's how to make sure you're heading in the right direction, towards the light. That gives us not only fellowship with Jesus, but also fellowship with one another and continual cleansing of any sin that makes its way into our lives. Spurgeon talks about this section. He says, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. He says, if guilt returns, his power may be proved again and again. There is no fear that all my daily slips and shortcomings will not be graciously removed by this precious blood. We sang the song, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. That's what the gospel brings. When we walk in His light, enjoying this intimate fellowship with Him, Our values, our thoughts, our words, our actions will be in harmony with God's character instead of the world's. I would point out that John is writing to believers here. Those already saved. Which means that the cleansing of Christ's blood is something we continually experience as we walk in the light. Why? Because sometimes we stumble. We don't have to. Sometimes we do. Paul talked about the war within, right? Between the flesh that still has sin living in it and the the new essence of who we are, our new spirit inside. 
this battle for our mind? Who will we choose? Which direction will we go? The war has been won. Some of the battles, not so much sometimes. If we're not paying attention, if we're not on our game, if we're not sober and vigilant. But listen, even if you stumble in your walk today, if your walk is towards the light, that sin is covered by grace through faith in Jesus, just like all the ones in the past. So long as you aren't choosing sin as the preferred direction of your life. Because you can't walk in darkness. You can't walk towards the darkness and be in fellowship with Him. If you take a wrong turn and get a little lost on your way to Chattanooga, but your intention all along was, was to get to Chattanooga, that will make you figure it out and get back on the right route as soon as possible. Your destination hasn't changed. You just wasted some time and some gas and some frustration. That might have been what caused you to stumble that day. I don't know. You aren't guilty of choosing Knoxville instead. You're still heading towards Chattanooga unless you turn and start heading towards Knoxville. That's the way it works. One theologian uh, puts this spiritual truth in these words. We might sum up John's teaching this way. He says, if the direction of your life is toward the source of light, you will find forgiveness for your failures and inadequacies. But if the direction of your life is toward the darkness, then you may be sure you have nothing in common with God. This is an either-or scenario. You are walking towards the source of light or away from it. There's no standing still, and there's no fence to straddle. There's no foot in two camps. You are one or the other. Choose today whom you will serve. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. The prevalent attitude of the culture we live in, people are essentially good. There's no absolute truth anyway, so what's wrong to you is fine, what's wrong to me is fine, whatever. If sin means missing the mark, but there's no real mark to aim for, it's pretty hard to say that you've missed it in the first place. Brilliant attack from the enemy, this postmodernist thought process. What is truth? No matter how accepted that idea is by the masses, anyone who says they are a good person and aren't in need of the forgiveness and salvation of the gospel is lying to themselves. You can only lie if you know what the truth is. It doesn't say they're confused. It says they are deceiving themselves. What does that mean? It means the truth is implanted in their hearts and minds, and they are, as Romans puts it, they're shoving it down. They're suppressing the truth in all unrighteousness. I hope that is not you today. Having this nagging feeling that, that all of this is true, but you don't want any part of it because you don't want to change your life. You like your life. And you got plenty of time. Hell is down the road somewhere. Tell that to my family who lost a 24-year-old this week. You don't know. If a lost person can't admit to being a sinner, they can't be saved. If someone who professes Christ can't admit to having committed a sin when they lose one of those battles between the flesh and their recreated spirit, then in all honesty, their spirit hasn't been recreated yet. Because the new spirit trusts God, believes God, wants what God wants. It walks in His light. And when it stumbles, it gets back up and refocuses and heads out again towards the light. 
Both of those people I just described are walking in darkness. They are heading in the wrong direction. So whether lost or saved, it is imperative that we understand and accept the fact that we will always need to access the forgiveness offered up by the gospel and our relationship with Jesus even after receiving the gift. All of which makes verse 9 so precious a reality for all of us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. If we're willing to acknowledge, declare openly, not deny any sin, He is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse. The idea is to admit that you agree with God about His standard being the standard. And that you haven't lived up to that in some way. To be open and honest about sin in your life can feel very degrading. It can bring on a lot of negative emotions, anxiety, fear, shame, regret, all of that. That's why verse 9 is so important. When you're a mess, even though you have real faith and have received real transformation, he is still faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Why? Because there is no darkness in him. And make note that when this happens, he doesn't just forgive us, but he cleanses us from all unrighteousness we have just allowed in. When he does that, it's not like going to the car wash. Okay? After a while, your car gets some paint, chips and scuffs and somebody banged it with a door and this that and the other you can take it to the car wash you can clean it up but it's not like new it's never going to be like new again confessing and having him forgive and cleanse you is not like going to the car wash it's like going to the paint booth you take that dinged up rusted out dirty hunk of junk car And you pull it in, and everything is made straight and new and painted. And it comes out looking like it did the day that it was made. And that is what God says he will do if you will just confess and repent. That's it. Again, I say hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for this message. I thank you for reminding us of how wide your mercy is, how deep your grace extends into our lives. I thank you for reminding us that your intention is to have this real relationship with us. What a blessing. Not just the assurance of salvation, but your presence in our life. May we have a lot of times when our our thought after spending some time with you is, man, didn't my heart burn? while I was reading the scripture? Didn't my heart burn while I was praying to God? Didn't my heart burn when the spirit came upon me and gave me the ability to do what I couldn't do? May we take advantage of all of that blessing while remaining humble like John who won't even use his name when describing such things because he knows it's not about him. It's about you. May it always be about you. May you be glorified in us when we leave this place. May we bear witness and declare the truth of you. It's in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Love y'all. Mike will be up here if you need prayer. Come on up.